Theodore Holden here from the icy frozen wastes of southern Texas, and I have been asked to say a few words about one of our supposed ancestors, the Neanderthal, and since I don't really have any standard college degrees or background in anthropology, paleontology, evolutionary biology, or anything like that, I should probably start by saying a few words about myself and what brings me to this kind of topic. My college degrees were in mathematics, and I have earned my living mainly as a software developer over the years. Things like tennis, volleyball, skeet shooting, duck hunting, judo contests, modern languages, the study of the history of spoken languages, and human origins topics have amounted to hobbies. None of those things have ever paid the rent here, nonetheless. Some of the questions involving human origins topics have begun to attract a considerable amount of attention recently. Around the middle of 2013, an English associate, Troy McLaughlin and I, published a book on human origins titled Cosmos in Collision, which offered a radical, if logical, departure from standard thinking about the origins of our solar system and about the recent history of our own planet and of several of the other bodies within our system. Troy had already published a book dealing with the prehistory of our solar system and some of the topics related to Egyptian iconography that you read about on the Thunderbolts.info forums had amounted to a shared interest. There is a web page called SaturnDeathCult.com which deals with the book and with issues related to it. Troy's college degrees, in fact, were in Egyptology with when somebody majors in Egyptology or Assyriology or anything like that, you can pretty much assume he's not a yuppie. Troy and I had quickly discerned that the subjects of human origins and solar system origins are inseparable. The one feeds into the other and the other into the one to such an extent that there is no understanding either of the two separately. The reasons for all of this will become apparent fairly quickly. In fact, it is mainly due to a general lack of understanding of this reality that the study of human origins in academic settings is in its present state. The study of human origins is generally in a fairly bad condition. Take the Neanderthal, for instance. The Neanderthal is generally viewed as the last surviving hominid, other than for humans, if you wish to call humans hominids, and as the most advanced hominid, and until recently, had been viewed as a missing link between humans and apes, in fact, due to the recent advances in the study of Neanderthal DNA, however, nobody believes that anymore. Neanderthal DNA is generally described as roughly halfway between ours and that of a chimpanzee, and, if anything, a bit closer to that of the chimpanzee. Even such organizations as Plus Biology view that as eliminating any possibility of human beings being descended directly from the Neanderthal, and so, Scientists, who ought to know better really, are now claiming that we and the Neanderthal are cousins with a common ancestor several hundred thousand years back, which is generally taken to be Heidelbergensis, a type of Homo erectus. The problem is that two genetically remote to be ancestral to is a transitive relationship. In other words, the claim is like claiming that wolves are too genetically remote from foxes to be ancestral to them, and that therefore foxes must be descended directly from fish. Okay, there's a logical problem. In fact, researchers in the late 19th and early 20th centuries at least had a fairly good idea of what they were seeing in Neanderthal remains. Take Ignatius Donnelly, for instance. Donnelly was a sort of a Renaissance type who had served as both a state and U.S. congressman and lieutenant governor of Minnesota, and had authored several books on recent prehistory. In his book, Ragnarok, The Age of Fire and Gravel, he notes, In another cave in the Neanderthal near Hochstale, between Dusseldorf and Elberfeld, Elberfeld a skull was found which is the most ape-like of all, all known human crania. The male to whom it belonged must have been a barbarian brute of the rudest possible type. The horrible and beast-like proportions of the Neanderthal skull speak with no less certainty 
of undeveloped, brutal, savage man, only a little above the gorilla in capacity, a prowler, a robber, a murderer, a cave dweller, a cannibal, a Cain. It's a safe bet that Donnelly would not have allowed his daughter to marry such a person. Likewise, the reconstructions of Marceline Bull. In other words, over recent decades, the Neanderthal has been recruited to serve as a poster child for a kind of a kumbaya pseudo-religion. What we actually know about Neanderthal remains strongly indicates that the scholars of the late 19th century were very much closer to being on the mark. The following is more or less what we actually know. Neanderthal DNA was roughly halfway between ours and that of a chimpanzee. By all accounts, that eliminates any possibility of humans being de descended from Neanderthals, and you pretty much have to begin by asking yourself what you would expect such a creature to look like. A slightly different human is not the correct answer. The Neanderthal skull was a very good match for an ape's profile and a bad match for a human profile. This is one of the first things that Danny Vendramini noticed. You can see the image. I mean, it's a pretty near perfect fit. There are no Neanderthal needles. Cro-Magnon needles, early human needles, are common. While nobody's ever found the first Neanderthal needle, a creature with a six-inch fur coat simply does not require needles. Okay, you can see the problem. Neanderthal footprints, more ape-like than human-like. And these are real footprints from a cave in Croatia. This is not something which has been you know, reconstructed. Um, Neanderthal rib cages, conical, as are those of the primates, to make room for the gigantic upper body musculature. Our rib cages are cylindrical. Eye sockets and nasal areas, very much larger than ours. Placement of noses and eyes on faces are much different than for humans. They're higher. The Neanderthal brain, while larger than ours, was dominated by the area of the brain associated with vision and motion. Our brains are dominated by the frontal cortex, the, the area associated with logic. We know that the mindset of the Neanderthal was similar to that of an African lion. He viewed the living world as neatly divided into two categories, that is, his own family group and meat. Even other Neanderthal families were on the menu when they find the remains of Neanderthal groups with clear butchering marks made by flint knives. We know from Rob Gargett that if you put the skulls of a human, a Neanderthal, and a lion together, the two which have much of anything in common are the Neanderthal and the lion. We know that Neanderthal population dynamics were similar to those of other predators and that there were never more than around 10,000 to 15 or 20,000 Neanderthals alive on the planet at any one time. We know that the Neanderthal could adapt to an omnivorous diet when it was available, but that for all intents and purposes in the settings of the European Ice Age, he was a pure carnivore. We know that Neanderthals were not giants. Seemingly the Eskimo of the hominid world, a tall Neanderthal might go 5'10 or 6 foot, but a male Neanderthal could easily have stood 5'9 and weighed 300 pounds with no extra weight on him. That's your perfect middle guard on a football team. We know that the Neanderthal was pronouncedly prognathic. Notice that when museums and or science journal articles show profile images of a Neanderthal skull, they most often show the Neanderthal looking down at his feet to avoid having him look as if he had a snout, that is, to make his face look flat like our faces. It should be obvious enough from the discussion here that virtually all of the representations of Neanderthals that we see in science journals and popular media are seriously misguided. Rob Gargett, who builds himself as the subversive archaeologist, has noted that even if we try to draw a completely humanized or yuppified Neanderthal with the eyes and nasal areas as large as the bones indicate they would have to be, what we end up with is still outlandish. And that's a pretty outlandish picture. But the problems are actually quite a bit more substantial than that. Again, standard depictions showing a human and a Neanderthal skull juxtaposed 
typically show the Neanderthal more or less looking down at his feet in order to have his face appear reasonably flat like a human face. Look at the lines of the teeth. You know, the line of the teeth for the human is horizontal. The, the line for the Neanderthal is sloped downwards. If, on the other hand, we rotate the Neanderthal skull just enough to have the line of the teeth horizontal, as the case with the human skull, the Neanderthal is plainly seen to have a snout just like a dog or a cat or any normal kind of land animal, including monkeys and apes. Again, as I have noted, beginning from the state of knowledge of the late 19th century, something has gone wrong with our understanding of what the Neanderthal actually amounted to. New Zealand scholar Danny Vendramini has published a book titled Them and Us, and created a stunning video, and images of that actually match up with actual evidence. The images from the book, from the videos, uh, and from this web page of his, which is called themandus.org, match up with what we actually know with everything we've just gone over. Again, there are no Neanderthal needles. Some of uh, Danny Vendermini's images show Neanderthals without fur for illustration purposes. Some show them with fur and some show them with and without fur juxtaposed. You can see that this is what the creature would look like without fur, you know, if you shaved his whole body. Um, this is the creature, the way he normally looked. And you can see that these images are quite a lot different from what you've been, what you've probably gotten used to seeing. Again, these images generally match the actual evidence from Neanderthal remains. There are two minor quibbles that I have with these images. One is that Danny Vendermini's artist has a, has a penchant for showing the Neanderthals with fight faces. Fighting is not a normal everyday experience for anything and for a predator to show a prey animal a face like that would scare the prey animal into the next county. I mean, it wouldn't serve any useful purpose. We have one very good artist, Jill Hollett, as a member of the Neanderthal Realities group on Facebook, and I asked her to try to draw a reasonable Neanderthal with a more business-like look about him. This is what she came up with, and I view this as quite good. It's a bit different from Danny Vendermini's representations, nonetheless. I mean, both of these, both this image and, and Danny Vendermini's images you know, follow, follow the, 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 the gist of what we actually know. I mean, they match up with real evidence. The other quibble I have involves the huge Neanderthal eyes, which are pretty much the first thing that jumps out at you in Danny Vendermini's images. Danny Vendermini assumed present conditions were something not hugely different from present conditions in past ages, and he assumed that the Neanderthal was diurnal and needed to be drawn with slit eyes like a house cat. The reality turns out to be quite a lot different from that. During most of the time during which the Neanderthal lived on Earth, he never saw anything that we would call daylight at all. Troy McLaughlin illustrates this. This is a depiction of Neanderthals in a purple dawn setting, which is the actual reality of life on Earth. 50, 60, 100,000, a couple of hundred thousand years ago. And then the same image as a Neanderthal might view it or as a human with a night vision scope might see it. Okay. This is the difference between having eyes adapted to those kinds of conditions and, you know, what you would need for, for a human to see what was going on. This also says that the Neanderthal brain, larger than ours slightly, but dominated by the area of the brain associated with vision, was to a large extent the neurological equivalent of the circuitry for a military night vision system. Remember that I stated early on that human origins and solar system origins cannot be understood separately and must be studied together. The real explanation for that and for what was going on and what produced a situation in which the Neanderthal never saw daylight will sound terribly strange to most people. 
However, it will not sound anywhere near as strange to somebody who is basically familiar with antique literature, and particularly the literature of ancient Greece and Rome. People seeking to invent an astral religion in today's world would invariably end up worshipping the sun and the moon, and possibly Venus. Somebody who knows when and where to look in today's sky could find Jupiter, but very few people would find Saturn, and nobody would ever end up worshipping Jupiter or Saturn. Nonetheless, the two chieftain gods of every one of the ancient religions were Jupiter and Saturn, the two former dwarf stars, and particularly Saturn. Vestiges of that ancient reality are still all around us. We still call our Sabbath Saturn's Day, or Saturday. The most major religious festival in ancient Rome was called Saturnalia. Virgil claimed that Rome itself was built over the ruins of a more ancient city called Saturnia. Plato consistently refers to antediluvians as nurslings of Kronos, Kronos being the Greek word for Saturn. Ovid, Hesiod, and other classical authors state that prior to the flood, there had been a golden age during which Saturn had been the king of heaven. In the same language, our sun is the king of heaven now. Trey McLaughlin's interpretation from the Saturn death cult of a dwarf star-centered system in which rocky bodies like Earth or Mars exist within the plasma sheath heliosphere of a dwarf star with the outside universe basically hidden from them by that opaque plasma heliosphere. And you've got something quite a lot different from our present solar system. This would be the southern part of the ancient solar system. Like I say, it's a different reality. One part of the idea is that such a planet would have radiant energy coming in from all sides as, it, as the radiant energy bounced off the interior of that plasma heliosphere. You wouldn't freeze to death, but the entire middle part of the light spectrum would simply be missing. You'd be living in a deep, dark, purplish kind of a world, which is the oldest oral tradition on Earth. The, 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 that's the reference to a purple dawn. You might expect the creatures of such a world to have huge eyes dealing with that sort of a darkish environment. In fact, they all did. The huge eye sockets, which you observe in dinosaur and hominid remains or adaptations for such a darkish environment, leftover creatures of that age, tarsiers, lemurs, owls, and the like, retain those kinds of eyes. The question of how a prehistoric solar system came about and how our present system arose from whatever that amounted to will be topics for further discussion.